welcome to Female Political Strategy. Female first, female forward. I'm your host, Ro. And I'm Willa. And I'm Elle. Ladies, right now, we are at war. You may not know you're in a war, but war you are in nonetheless. What is that war? It's the attack of the furry anime avatars. <laughs> They're all in your mentions. They're uploading the most absurd, insane ideas. They're derailing every conversation. Posting the stupidest takes on Twitter. And causing a bunch of division between women on both political sides of the aisle. <laughs> when you're sorry. about to go, when you're at war, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> when, yeah, when you're about to go to war, you got to know the terrain. You got to know your enemy. You got to know the environment in which you're fighting this war, right? Wasn't there a Sun Tzu quote somewhere in there? What's the Sun Tzu quote? Know thy enemy. Of course there is. Yeah, before they know you. If yeah. you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. Sun Tzu. We, we got L, our military strategist, our in-house military strategist, to tell us about the... Uh, What's up? Tell us more about the war on women or the informational war on women. Absolutely. <laughs> what is that? Sun Tzu said... Uh, know the enemy and know yourself in a hundred battles. You'll never be in peril. Yeah. I mean, the quote's much longer than that. So that's all I could find on Google. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I could find on Google. I think we're quoting the same thing. <laughs> this is my go- my extensive Google research. <laughs> yeah. Two clicks later. You want me to click on links and look further? I mean, what are you asking for? <laughs> uh-uh. Know me better algorithm. If you're not reading the first line and the first link, then what are you really doing? If you're only screenshotting a title of an article, then what are you doing? Right. Right. <laughs> um, so let's do a quick, you know, understanding. So the military, uh, when you are trying to figure out where you're going and what's going on there before you get there, it's called intelligence preparation of the environment. So I want to do a quick, just illumination of what is going on as it stands. Things are absolutely insane. Polarization is the word of the day. I know that's the case in the United States, and it's spreading across the world. Lilith, would you say there's some polarization going on in Canada? Um, I'd say it's not as bad as the States, but it is becoming more polarized in recent years, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not without, like, it's not coincidental. It's happening intentionally. Um, It's going to sound a little conspiracy theory, but I'm going to stay away from the commentary side of the house. And in this episode, I'm going to be very deliberate about using only facts and only statistics, in fact, and everything that you would want sourced. To preface the rest of the story, this is actually an area where Elle is a subject matter expert. So she's worked with professionals on this very subject. So we're going to be learning from her. My wheelhouse. In the realm of, of national defense. National defense as it pertains to cyber warfare and how it's affecting and infiltrating social media platforms to create even more division. Yeah. So this is my wheelhouse. This is kind of what I do as a day job, but it's even more interesting when I can bring it down to the personal level and talk to women about how this impacts us directly. The information environment where this warfare is happening is anywhere that people consume information. So right now it's the internet and quote unquote, the mainstream media. And then you have this issue of information warfare, where there is an active intent to sway and influence what you think as a form of political weapon, right? But somebody has to be wielding this weapon. So who is it? Well, it's not a cabal of satanic pedophiles. Contrary to popular belief. Contrary to popular (laughs) belief, it is not a, it is not a a coalition of scientists trying to trick you into thinking the world is flat. Nope. Nope. It's none of the, it's none of those. Um, (laughs) It's not a bunch of scientists either. Um, In fact, it is one of the parties that's involved named and it's completely open source. uh, It's Russia. Right. But don't worry, I'm not suggesting that Russia is targeting you personally like that's conspiracy theory. But what I am saying is a lot of what's going on is a consequence of Russian hybrid warfare, one of which is information warfare, weaponizing the cognitive domain, your mind, how you think, believe and what you know and the perception that you have of people. That's your cognitive domain. I wanted to reiterate that because sometimes when they when people talk about cyber warfare, it's a buzzword that I don't think everyone completely understands what it means, right? Because they just think like, oh, it's people trying to get your passwords or people trying to fish for information. But there's also an element of cyber warfare by which they're actually trying to actively influence public opinion through false information. Yeah. And I know that was kind of a, a, a 
bone of contention with a lot of the major social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter and, and uh, people going and sharing like uh, really terrible, sharing false stories, especially when it came to the election and um, the fight over who has control of the narrative and why, and then what kinds of information is being put in front of people. Yeah. And it's all of, all of it is intentional. And what's hybrid warfare? What is hybrid warfare? Any form of war, like attack, disabling, sabotaging, making sure that your adversaries are weakened, short of actual conventional war, right? So you're talking using intelligence capabilities, diplomatic capabilities, economic, sociocultural, lawfare, which is use of their own legal systems against them. Um, And then you have cyber, and then you have energy, infrastructure, crime, and then military in the form of like irregular warfare, But the one we're focusing on today is information warfare, and information warfare targets hearts and minds. And you weaponize that. You weaponize it, and the intention is to get people to do the dirty work for you. Admittedly, we are in what we call today strategic competition with Russia. And this is going to get a little geopolitical and nerdy, but I'll skim right past it. We're We're in political competition with Russia. America is a known global superpower. Russia obviously doesn't like that. See, Cold War. And they're trying to change the narrative. They're trying to change what's going on in the world, right? But everybody knows that Russia conventionally cannot compete with the U.S. And if it does, you have numerous consequences that are not good for anybody, including Russia or the U.S. But what Russia does have in its arsenal in a David Goliath kind of way is literally everything else at its disposal. Why? Because Putin is a dictator, He's an authoritarian figure. The entire government, the military, economy, everything is his to use at his disposal. In the U.S., we have something called checks and balances. We have separations between different entities. We're essentially siloed. So Russia is more at liberty to weaken us because it works in their best interest if they want to become the superpower they once were, they once were, I think, like the Soviet Union. But even if they aren't a superpower, it just seems like it's sour grapes, right? Yeah. Is this just yeah, an yeah. extension? It's just to st- uh, them getting back at us for the the Cold War. They're bitter. <laughs> it seems like even if they're in a pos- if they're not in a position to actually take over, it's just enough to bite at our ankles and destabilize us. You summed it up. Yeah, it's like if I can't win, I'll make sure you don't win. That's essentially the tactic at play here. And again, that's an that's a gross op- oversimplification of what's going on. Um, but yeah, Ro, just like you said, they're bitter a lot of ankle biting, a lot of like annoying death by a thousand cuts type of deal. And that's why information warfare and all of these other non-war type of non-combat warfares work. And that's why they're using it. Because look at what's happening. More Americans hate America than support it. That's actually wild to me that so many Americans like hate America. I mean, there are some Canadians who are like, oh, Canada's bad and stuff. But like, what other country hates itself more than America? (laughs) We can just say it as a joke. Well, I guess like not to say it quantifiably, but qualitatively, the level of polarization is demonstrated in our mainstream media, which is Fox News versus CNN, where you have diametrically opposed views that on a daily basis contradict each other and further polarize this country on on an hourly basis. And that's just it's common ground. Right. You can turn on the TV and look for common knowledge. Is the mainstream media polarization an effect of Russian bots or is it just easy to monetize division? Or are they just taking advantage of the pre-existing division? They are a consequence of the bots. Yeah. So they're a consequence of the bots, right? Yeah, because the first thing that people think about when you say like Russian information warfare, first thing that comes to mind is is Russian bot farms. So like it's almost become a meme. So what's up with that? Are they real? (laughs) (laughs) Yes and no. Yes and no. Um, Russian bot farms are just entities that create a lot of fake profiles. I think we've seen them all online. The bots, the mass followers, the mass engagement, the mass things that you can just go buy and like retweet on your behalf, follow you on your behalf and make it look like your engagement is much higher than it really is because most of it is just coding, right? And a lot of this coding can be weaponized to do certain things to make it look like information is being consumed and perpetuated by people when it's really bots retweeting bots retweeting bots. But in order to retweet, you have to have an original piece of content, right? And the way these bots work is they find the most fringe, 
not so popular, and I'm using my words very carefully as a conservative, but niche beliefs, irrespective of political leaning. So talk about far left and far right. I'm not going to go into specifics. Those really fringe beliefs that do not, that are so far outside common discourse, outside of the Overton window, and they perpetuate it and normalize it and get it to trend giving the illusion that more people on one side or the other believe and agree and are normally considering these concepts that aren't really normal or being considered by real people in the first place, right? Yeah, and I've noticed it doesn't take much to make certain ideas trend on Twitter either because usually things start trending when it hits over a thousand retweets or a thousand mentions of the same item. So I could easily see. It's not just how many tweets, it's also how fast it happens. So on Reddit, for example, if it gets a certain number of upvotes or comments within an hour or two hours or something like that, it's more, it's pretty much guaranteed to hit the front page. And so one of the ways that people mess with the Reddit algorithm, for example, is by upvoting really quickly the posts that they want to the, the divisive posts that they want to put in front of people's faces. Or mass downvoting. I know we experienced that on FDS as well as there were, there were organized entities outside of Reddit even who were trying, who are still, still trying to get FDS kicked out. So they will post something inflammatory that the mods don't catch and then try to mass upvote it really quickly or yeah. something that they just don't like. They'll mass downvote it or they'll, they'll organize with what's called vote brigading, right? So anybody who's familiar with Reddit knows that that's uh, technically against Reddit's terms of service, but it's not very well policed. So the same thing occurs on other platforms like Twitter, Facebook. And, and also ever since the brigading thing became a thing that people knew existed, now it's something that like whenever you want to accuse someone of something bad, it's like, oh, FD like for example, uh, whenever FDS has a post about uh, from like one of the relationship advice subreddits about uh, a man being a piece of shit and we go like, oh, we should like support this woman or send her a message. Then other people who don't like FDS will say FDS is brigading the relationship advice subreddits. Even with that, some of the brigading is again being done by outside entities because they know it's a bannable offense, right? So they'll sign up or follow someone, they'll follow the FDS subreddit, and then they'll follow any links and just write a bunch of spam comments, right? Or mass downvote anything in that. Uh, link and then say it's coming from your uh, from your subreddit. But all they have to do is to create like an account, follow a bunch of people and harass them that way and then brigade from one post to another post. And that counts as brigading from your subreddit, even though it's it's not actually your users. It's someone from an outside force. I mean, it, it makes for good conversation because a lot of that is really important because you're talking about like metrics that human beings can be outdone by bots, right? You're talking about retweets, likes, and getting things popular and trending by metrics. And that's when you involve, you know, technology to do the work for you, which is what the Russian bot farms. It's Russia's like cyber information warfare arm sources will be included for that one. But all that to say is what they do is they take all these fringe concepts, perpetuate them, like them at a rate that no human being can like, bring it to our attention when we normies are on the internet and we see this trending, right? And a lot of these fringe concepts have a unique psychological impact. They make you feel something. They completely bypass your frontal cortex, which is the rational part of your brain, your mammalian one, which kind of has like doubt and curiosity, and go right to your li like your lizard brain. If you your stupid ass lizard brain, that's like fight or flight, fight, flight or fuck. Like that's three things that it does, and it makes you feel something on a visceral level so quickly that you automatically have accepted this before you even realize you weren't thinking about it. And then by the time it goes back out, what's going through your mind is you are now rationalizing something that you've already accepted as truth on a very visceral level right? You're contemplating the veracity of something that may or may not even be real or pertinent or relevant before you even had a chance to think about it. And those are the things that they get going, right? We're having arguments and discussions about things that don't make sense on purpose. Because when we get to talking about things that are so fringe, so crazy, like, is the earth round? <laughs> Remember that massive internet argument about like flat earthers? But a lot of them were exposed to be bots. 
a lot of that information and the arguments and all that were perpetuated by bots. And you know, on a deep level, like the earth is round, but now you're already discussing it as if though the possibility of this being true is there. It's causing people to doubt the most basic of facts, right? And when people are doubting basic facts, it makes them more mentally pliable and like easier to control or easier to influence. Exactly. So now you've created this baseline doubt where something that's been proven, where you have pilots, right? People that are brilliant beyond belief who've actually been around the globe and their instruments are tailored to a round earth are joining this discussion as if though it's a normal discussion to have. Like, Anyway, so the, the information environment is now no longer set. There's no basis for truth. And now you can, like, chaos ensues. We're now bringing in the anime avatars that are bringing in conversation points that are so out of far left field. But the information environment is already so pliable that they now are on par with relevance as, like, other concepts that are actually worth debating. There is a level ground for what is debatable and what isn't because there's no basis for truth. So why is this happening? Um, Just to sum up the geopolitical background really quickly, Russia, again, kind of bitter from the past. Key thing they're trying to influence is their geographic near border states, right? You can fast forward through this if you're not interested. I totally get and respect that. But they're trying to get old Soviet Union back in this like pipe dream. But they also know that pipe dream is not possible. But to have every country that borders you hate you on some level, not cool. So they're trying to gain control, influence and control over that region. And then you have the external part, what was former Soviet Union, now part of Europe, the Balkan states, uh, or Baltic. It's actually Balkan and Baltic states, yeah. Yes. So, they're, yeah, so basically bordering states, the Baltic Balkan states, and then you have the tertiary interests that are soft threats, not direct threats, but soft threats, like the Western nations, Germany, US, uh, Canada, you kind of fall in with us too. Sorry. You go wherever we go. Yeah. No, I'm cool with that. Canada and the US, we're like, we're number one trade partners. We're, we're BFS, whether we like it or not. We're frenemies. <laughs> right. By the way, number one special operations force. Y'all are great partners. Shout out. Oh, really? Oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. I'll save that for another episode. Um, but yeah, so... Now you have this interest to kind of make sure that Russia isn't getting outpaced too far, right? So what what do they do? You bring everybody down, crabs in a bucket. If I'm down, y'all coming down with me. Level that playing field. And now you have this malleable information environment where radical radical concepts are a form of truth that is up for debate. The veracity test is gone. Like, hey, is this even feasible? Gone. And now when you create this like chaos environment and everything is up for discussion, where do you draw the line, right? Now you have grandmas radicalizing in their attics against people they've never met before. <laughs> and then you have other people over here that think like there's phobias against phobias against phobias. And then, you know, insane victim narratives. And I'm not like pointing anyone out. This is bipartisan, apolitical attack on the Western people. And I speak specifically to the American people when I say this. I mean, we all can fall victim to it. It's very sophisticated what it is that they're doing. If you find yourself watching something or listening to something and you feel something before you even thought about what was just said, kind of take a step back, you know, and it's not just the bots putting this out either. It's we put it out for them. We're the ones actually doing the lead work. Yeah, the bots just get it out there. Yeah, it's not like the bots are out there writing content or creating YouTube videos or so on. It's like the people that are creating the content and then the bots amplify the most crazy people. Yes. And then there's like some AI involved where there's like bots that bicker, but that's that's a whole nother thing. That's the rabbit hole. Um, but yeah, so it's, it, it's very interesting what they've done. And it sounds so crazy that this sounds less true than what the bots are perpetuating. But it's true. It's real. I work with it. I brief it to very senior decision, senior policymakers and decision makers. It is a real threat that's going on. And you are the target, not intentionally. Like you personally aren't that important, but you as a metric, as a U.S. person, Canadian, Western, English speaking nation, you are a target, just so you know. 
When I say Russian, I mean the Russian government and political interests. So the Russian government and the Russian military, not the Russian people. Yeah. So don't go out there and bully a random Russian kid. Okay. Like (laughs) Russian people are fine. We're talking about the Russian government. Not the Russian people. Government. And yeah. And when I say they are targeting the American government, we are a consequence of international drama. Just so you know, we're innocent. U.S. people are innocent. Russian people are innocent. It's the government's duking it out using us as collateral. Like Russia is trying to advance its natu- national interests and creating this chaos environment is the means that they're doing it. And everyone else is just sort of collateral damage in the process. And I, I wanted to talk about how all this relates to women, because of course, this social media environment, it affects everyone, right? But I wanted to talk about specifically the impact it's had on women and on feminism and on our on women's ability to organize politically. Because when you're operating in a media environment that's so polarizing, that's so controversial, where everyone is decided among these groups, where there's like these weird shibboleth, where if you think this or you say this, then you're part of that group and therefore you're bad and therefore, you know, it's okay to denounce you and so on. Um, It's like we live in this media culture that's created barriers for women and made it hard for us to organize politically. Um, I I think a lot of people tend to think that there's like this cabal of like patriarchal men that are like, you know, that are, I don't know, in bed with Mark Zuckerberg and Jeffrey Epstein. They're out there trying to create this like cabal (laughs) of like the cove of billionaire villains, the cove, a cove of like billionaire pedophile villains or something like that, you know, but it's not, it's not that, um, we're not saying it's not not that. We're just saying it's probably something else too. <laughs> we're not saying that the cabal of yeah. We're not saying the cabal of pedophiles does not exist. But <laughs> no kidding. Um, we're just not talking about them right now. <laughs> no, we're saying that. Um, understand that feminism is one of those divisive topics that gets targeted by Russian bots. And so understand that when you're trying to advance feminist narratives or trying to organize politically understanding the, I don't know, some of the ways that that polarization is, is uh, working against our goals as feminists. And specifically working against our goals as women, as a social class, because part of the problem is that the narratives are being framed by so often by men. And then men set up these false binaries where they say, like, if you believe this, you can't have this. Or uh, they, uh, they, they take every single feminist argument to ad absurdum, or even also, and this actually happens to more liberal feminists, as well as radical feminists, as well as conservative feminists, like women who would consider themselves women uh female advocates they take whatever argument they have to the absurd right and then they amplify those absurd arguments so far so that other women react to the absurd argument and then say these other women are automatically my enemy and it's not to say that there aren't absurd women in the world it's just that they're being given a much larger platform than the vast majority of people who might be uh somewhat aligned with that political ideology might actually believe yeah like that's why so many women are anti-feminists like that's why there's so many anti-feminist women because they think to be a feminist is to be like a blue haired, like septum piercing, uh, Zizem pronouns with, I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and that goes back to the aligned goals of the podcast, which is, Hey, there are so many women who are, who are normies, who are, normal, who are interested in the advancement of women's rights, but just feel culturally ostracized by the septum pierced, blue haired feminists who all are maybe come from the same, uh, educated background, uh, live in a coastal city. They have their own insular culture. And there's just a ton of women who don't, who don't align to that culture, even though they may be interested in women's rights. And so, you know, part of the reason for female political strategy in general is to expand our understanding of what feminism is and really understand the pressures that are coming towards women from all different walks of life. And, and like, not in a superficial way, but understanding why women vote certain ways, why women uh, think about certain things about the reproductive biology and come up with a more comprehensive feminism that's not being driven by these divisive forces, um, some of which are coming from Russian bots, right? Who are, who are forcing us to create these these political binaries perpetuated by yeah perpetuated by by uh russian bots who are forcing us into these political corners and creating unnecessary adversaries as a conservative woman we are absolutely alienated from the feminist discussion and what i also picked up on is there's an understanding of 
how women on the right or conservative women relate to feminism as is, right? Because these conversations aren't being had across platforms because we have been so polarized from one another where the right's view of feminism is this blue painted, blue haired, you know, like read college, no offense, but like read college educated Portlandian, you know, speaking for all of women. It's like, as a conservative, I'm like, you don't, un- don't speak for me. And on the flip side, conservative women have all been painted as this idea of this Gilead style, Serena, Serena joy. Yeah. Serena joy esque character. That's, you know, fully submissive to her husband and tell me as you are. And the trad wife, Trump supporter. <laughs> yes. The alt-right trad wife, Trump supporter who works from home, i.e. not me. Yeah. And sells essential oils online. No. <laughs> <laughs> and Lulu LaRue. No offense. No, that's more that's more a hotel. Horseshoe theory, sis. Horseshoe. They're there. Really? On the conservative side? I really thought that was like a Yeah, pat- military wives. Military wives. The dependa culture? I thought that was like a patchouli uh patchouli hemp rope type oat milk drinking type feminist <laughs> rather no. than like the granola parent. No nope. <laughs> granola, the granola feminist. Mis- they all meet in the end. Yeah. So Lulu LaRue. But like horseshoe theory. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking they they're selling they're really big into scrapbooking and they are yeah and journaling and selling lulu the rue and yeah it, it i mean it is what it is right but at the end of the day <laughs> these are caricatures so that's one thing that leftist and right-wing women have in common is we they the housewives both want to sell lulu rue and essential oils we all fall for mlms <laughs> the real problems are mlms right run by men <laughs> Is Avon still a thing in Tupperware? Yes. <laughs> oh, and they've like evolved. Well, let, let me call my local Avon lady. Anyways, Mary Kay. Yeah, Mary Kay. <laughs> okay. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so we have these like caricature understanding of each other's side. And where does this come from? Information warfare. We've been fed by our own respective echo chamber that this, you know, battle has created for each side so everybody's screaming from their little silo of what they think the other side is like and everybody's like well we don't even know this person over here we don't this is not what we're mostly like right so they just give a voice to the craziest and then we call that normal honestly that's why i'm kind of like worried for this podcast i'm like worried the algorithm's gonna like tank our podcast because we're just trying to find (laughs) common ground and ways that we can like that we can maybe see eye to eye on each other trying to break down that binary and then the russian bots are gonna be like no we cannot allow this to spread i don't know we'll (laughs) we'll have to see hopefully (laughs) hopefully the uh hatred of fbs will carry us uh no i'm kidding but (laughs) I mean, we were born in the negative ratio. I don't give a shit. Have we ever been outside the negative ratio and yet we thrive? And still I rise. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, like, are we benefiting from this polarization? Are are we benefiting from the fact that men hate us so much, you know? Kind of. Like men find FDS, they get triggered. The bots <laughs> see that they get triggered and then they spread it even more. And then that puts it in front of all. Now all men think that, oh, every woman <laughs> is like, you know, size queen and only wants a guy who's like six feet tall, six figure income, blah, blah, blah. Woe is me. I'm going to be an incel for the rest of my life. I'm going to go shoot up a school. Chaos environment. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And they radicalize themselves way prior to FDS. True. Yeah. When they, when they find things on FDS to be mad about and then say, oh, this is going to lead to increased inceldom or violence and attacks. And like FDS has been around since 2019. What was the excuse for the two decades prior to that? Right. So. Yeah. Or, or 2000 years before that. Anyways. I think what ends up happening is like the bots have helped bring this out of like the dusty corners and it tells everybody, Hey, this has been hidden from your view. This has been hidden from your view. And it makes it seem like it's a lot bigger and a lot more attention grabbing than it really is even though it's existed for a very long time it just looks for those things that are tiny and different and unique and then brings it out so the bots kind of help this is that why when i'm browsing youtube and it shows me a video from like six or seven years ago of a cat like (laughs) vomiting or something and is that nah that's just you bro is that how it works it's just like i'm gonna this was no that's just you no that's just me okay that's just you that's the cookies speaking (laughs) yeah that's the cookies (laughs) you did that to yourself (laughs) that's really about it that's just like a brief summary of what the fuck is going on bro like 
that's that's the sweet end. Um, if you want to nerd out, uh, hit me up on Twitter. I'll definitely post all sorts of this, like all the sources and stuff, and there'll be a few in the show notes for sure. When I was talking to Elle about her background and area of expertise, I was absolutely fascinated because it reminded me of this book that I came across uh, by Jessica Megri, who's an Australian feminist researcher. The book is called The Limitations of Social Media Feminism, No Space of Our Own. And she brings up the point how the internet is a mixed sex space. So men are joining conversations about feminism and also that men own these social media platforms. She points out how with the women's liberation movement in like the sixties and seventies, you know, um, how women would have, you know, consciousness raising groups, they'd have face to face meetings with each other. They didn't have social media. So if they wanted to talk about feminists, they'd have to have that, you know, they couldn't just tweet at each other. They had to talk in person. I know crazy for someone raised on social media. It's like, wow, having an in-person meeting like crazy no i'm kidding um so not only are there men in conversations about feminism so men own the social media platforms and then to add on to that as l brought up where women are divided not just between different feminist groups such as rad femme versus lib femme you know left versus right you know conservative trad con trad wife conservative versus you know bespectacled lib femme there's also more infighting within these groups so you know even on rad femme twitter which i have a love hate relationship by the way <laughs> with by the way you know you'll get the, the takes that get amplified are things like tampons are misogynistic or uh you know can you be a feminist if you have a boyfriend or um yeah but that's the thing like most rad femmes are not don't believe in like free bleeding right that's the thing like the only the most like yeah and they lose most women there including myself because i'm like sis i'm not about to ruin my 300 hundred dollar dress just free bleeding all over the place it makes zero sense oh my god free bleeding is like you know how many times free bleeding has come up on deployment where i get looked at as a resident woman liaison like hi female What's up with free bleeding? I'm like, I don't fucking know. Niche, like crazy perspectives get elevated. And so a lot of women, they see a single rad femme account that says tampons are misogynistic and they think, ah, you know, radical feminism is crazy. It's not for me. I don't want to like get involved. With I don't want to be involved with those crazy people. Right. I don't want to be associated with those crazy people. And it turns women off of these sorts of movements that have a net positive for us. Right. Um, Anyway, so, and, and also the culture of denunciation. That's another thing I really don't like on social media is like, if, you know, people are so quick to just completely cut someone off and, you know, say someone who you mostly agree with says one thing you disagree with and then being like, cancel, <laughs> cancel, blocked. I'm going to not associate myself with this person again. Or, you know, say they do an interview on, you know, a news site and then they contact the news site. Why are you platforming this horrible, terrible, evil person and blah, blah, blah. And so this is a really big problem because so often and, and this has happened to us, especially in that Vice piece where they lambasted us for retweeting Julie Bindle. I think a couple Julie Bindle, and and it was something completely unrelated to I think trans rights. It was something com like she called us basically she called us transphobic because we retweeted Julie Bindle, but the thing that re we retweeted was a story about a teenage girl being raped so yeah that's what it was it's like if you ever retweet or associate yourself with someone who's done a wrong thing, it means that. Or, you know, if you like someone's tweet, it means that you endorse every single one of their opinions or something like that, right? So it's just this very, like, you're either with us or you're against us, and there's no room for disagreement, even no matter how tiny. So you touch on something that is very much so, like, I think people make fun of the right for it, but it, it's coming to light more. And I even see people on the left, and you're kind of touching on it too, but the right's been screeching about cancel culture for a yeah. long time. And it was a lot, it was a very like Abe Simpson, you know, cane at the shaking cane at the sky, you know, Oh my God, the kids and their damn cancel culture, but it's very real. And what's happening is there's a censoring of polite discourse or even important and nuanced discourse where you get canceled. If you bring up anything contrary to, accepted ways of thinking like you said wrong think if you dare veer, ve uh, sorry veer from the narrative you're canceled on whatever level 
the one thing I'll say about that is the re- the biggest reason why people don't have sympathy for the right is because for so long the right had the gavel, yeah. <laughs> and meaning especially the religious right for sure. And they ha- and I'm not giving them I'm not giving them like a green light of you know it was very grandpa esque it was very boomer style cancel culture screeching, but now it's coming to um it's coming to light that there was some evidence lending itself to hey maybe we need to be more careful as to how we censor people and how we stop and how we police conversations. Are we policing or are we protecting the sanctity of diverse thought? Because I think that's very different. It's interesting. I'm old enough to remember when J.K. Rowling was counseled by the right because of her books promoting witchcraft. Yeah. And now she's been... Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Canceled by the left over her alleged transphobic views. So it's quite interesting to see how the pendulum... It's quite interesting to see the the pendulum swing on this one person over like my lifetime. And I'm not even that old. There was a time when J.K. Rowling was being like literally denounced by a lot of right wingers because they thought she was promoting satanic ideas. And now she's now being denounced by uh, the cultural left. <laughs> a different first different set of satanic ideas. <laughs> yeah, a different set of yeah, satanic ideas. And so it's quite interesting to see the, the pendulum swing. You bring up a really great point because think about who's canceling. J.K. Rowling on the left. It's not the average left winger. I would say decidedly it's a very unique subset of people on the left that are canceling J.K. Rowling this time. And you know what? Everybody on the right would also agree back when she was being canceled for witchcraft because it was like myself, conservative, newly conservative at the time. It's like, wait, we're canceling whom for what? No, 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 no. No, we're not doing that. Uh, So the witchcraft was the religious zealots on the right that, you know, are the Bible thumping, screeching at church, Southern Baptist, which are there on the conservative side, but they don't speak for all conservative. I mean, would anybody on the left argue that people who cancel J.K. Rowling speak for the entire left? Not even close. That, yeah. That's the thing. I feel like moderates, moderate conservatives and moderate liberals actually have more in common with each other than they do with the extremists of their own party. Exactly. Exactly my point. But Ro, I also really get what you're saying. It's we've let the lowest common denominator of each side speak cohesively for everybody. Yeah. And I think it's now we're having a reckoning. Yeah, we talked about lib fems and the shock value, like the shock value sex, you know, like feminism is now blowing homeless guys behind the dumpster and if you don't if your feminism doesn't include do the patriarchy to me yeah do the patriarchy if your feminism doesn't include women who do the patriarchy to me then yeah you're not a real feminist like that kind of shit right so i I feel like those those narratives the shock value that also gets amplified it does and i remember distinctly jezebel.com promoting like craigslist hookups and if you think dating apps are bad imagine meeting a random person off craigslist and then calling this empowering. That's fucking dangerous. Yeah. I know. Right. Like how to properly have a, a, a Craigslist hookup. And I'm like, this is literally scraping the bottomest of the barrel Ugh. for sex. <laughs> but see how most normal women would see that? Like, mo- I think most normal women, conservative or liberal, would see that kind of article and be like, that's stupid. So I feel like yeah. most of the clicks that that kind of Jezebel article would get isn't even people who genuinely want to learn how to do a hookup is just people clicking on that to be like, that is fucking stupid and crazy. And I don't want to, you know, I want to yell at this kind of thing. Right. It's like a train crash or like a car crash scene, right? You can't help but stare at it. Not because you condone what happened, but you're like, uh, I can't stop staring. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You can't take your eyes off the, off the accident as it's happening. So, so yeah, with, with all of these, obstacles in mind with all of these challenges to women's political organization uh in mind with the <laughs> the invasion of anime profile pictures um you know what are some ways that women can fight back what are some ways that women can defend ourselves against this these <laughs> what are some ways women can defend ourselves from the anime profile picture bot crowd yeah because i'm tired you know i'm gonna you know i'm really tired of i'm tired of searching certain uh controversial terms and then the porn bots spamming it because that's another thing they're doing which is highly disturbing i've seen things i don't want to see spamming abusive porn yeah people are so mean at our reddit moderators but you have no i actually just so you know i actually demodded myself just because 
it actually made me sad to like, it really destroys your Reddit experience being an FDS moderator versus just an FDS user. Um, and so I like, yeah, as much as you might hate the Reddit moderators, they have seen some shit. Okay. Like we have, <laughs> I have fucking PTSD from some of the stuff that I did when I was an active moderator, right? Like just being spanned with like, Nazi porn. <laughs> back to your active duty days. Yeah, back to my active duty days as a Reddit moderator. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> stolen valor. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you to your service to the information environment. No, you served in the information war of the 21st century. <laughs> we're, we're all veterans in the information war. Yeah, right. So we've <laughs> seen some <laughs> shit. Okay, I'm fucking like we've been we've been traumatized by by that stuff, right? So. um be nicer to our Reddit mods. And we don't get paid or any ben- benefits from it. We just get to be called like uh, piss field cat ladies who are going to die alone. Oh, man. And then see all sorts of uh, all sorts of men in various states of undress against our will. Dick pics. So many dick pics. I did not know dick pics could be so artistically diverse. I've seen so many dick pics. Oh, my God. I mean, they don't just send penis pics. They send deliberately disturbing things. Yeah. And I'm not even a mod and I'm a victim of the information war in a non-combat, like just from the safety of my home. So thank you guys. Thank you for your service in standing up to keep our internet clean. Yeah. So things like, you know, rape threats, death threats, um, all that stuff. What can we do about the, you know, information war on women so my first piece of advice, actually, my first solution is social media should be used as a tool to facilitate in-person political organization. It should not be the the environment itself for political organization. So because social media is an insane asylum, specifically Reddit in particular. <laughs> so right? let's say you post a hot take on Twitter, you get a few thousand likes or retweets or whatever. That doesn't actually affect policy in any real way. I would say, you know, talk to women in real life, engage in consciousness raising activities with your friends, just even just talking about, you know, people say we're, we're all you're just man haters, all you're just complaining about men. But I think complaining about the and recognizing patterns of male behavior and talking to women in real life about it is absolutely valuable. So on to just to follow up with what Lola said about talking to people differently than you, diversifying your thought pool is the healthiest thing you can do. I mean, a lot of us spent a lot of time on the internet due to consequences of what happened in the early, you know, 2020, 2021, sorry, 2020, 2021. So meet and talk to people that are very different than you. Get to know them, understand why they think what they think. You don't have to agree with them. I think there's this understanding that if you talk to someone, it has to be someone you agree with, especially if you're young and in your early 20s, mid 20s, late 20s, doesn't matter. Talk to them and if something triggers you and you get that visceral reaction where it's like fight or flight or, you know, life or death feeling where you're feeling so strongly about a piece of information that you weren't thinking about a minute ago and now has you debating life itself, take a step back. Do you really even believe that? Like, look at it for what it is and look inward before you act on it and respond with like vitriol because you're just muddying up the information space for everyone and perpetuating this cycle of information combat. That's my high horse. And I I do this thing where I get angry about things I find on Twitter all the time. Right. And so I'm definitely feeding the, feeding the information warfare machine uh, when I, when I do that, but being mindful of, you know, the times that you feel angry. I don't know. I feel like, I I feel like I do pretty good. I feel like kids these days, they're like, Oh, if I see something that makes me angry on the internet, I'm a sub, I've been, I've been a victim of literal violence, (laughs) you know? And uh, and, yeah, it's like, if you make me feel uncomfortable or if you make me feel triggered or whatever, I've been subjected to a hate crime, that kind of crowd, you know, maybe, um, or, or, you know, the other person is a bad person. Someone else must be default and must be punished for this. Like that kind of, um, attitude, like be, get comfortable with talking to people who believe differently than you, even if you disagree. I think actually, especially if you disagree with them, um, trying to identify how they think that way and also trying to identify any common ground, particularly with other women. 
Yeah, there was a a really uh, poignant quote that was making the rounds on Twitter about how a lot of Twitter is just people imagining a person that doesn't exist and then getting mad at that person that doesn't exist. And essentially, (laughs) because of the way the algorithms work and the the way that the bots work, there so many people have created these straw men that don't actually exist in real life. And those uh, caricatures and understandings of people often fall apart when you start to actually understand these individual people and their motivations, right? Um, I will say part of the reason why we started the podcast was to take the discussion of FDS offline because again we are we're at the mercy of the algorithms on Reddit and on some of the other social media sites that we're on and why that's essentially bad is like so often the negative extreme um, ideas get pushed to the top. And I know, and like we already discussed, like it, it contributes a lot to the moderators declining mental health, <laughs> mental and emotional health. Yeah. But also <laughs> it's like a lot of times creates this like a uh, insular paranoid um, environment. That's not as focused on real world solutions to make people's lives materially better. And we thought that, um, having this conversation free of those rhythmic algorithms where it's just us talking, Yeah, because when you're a Reddit moderator, you're not writing strategy posts and shit. You're just like, you're just trying to constantly defend yourself from this just wave after wave after wave of like male hostility. And it's like, you're you're not given an opportunity to actually build anything or create anything. You're just trying to prevent yourself from being destroyed. Yeah. And that's like, and that's not, we're not going to get anywhere that way. We're not going to be able to push forward the narratives and the ideas that we want to do. So part of us fighting this uh, information warfare is us getting off of these platforms, or at least like uh, it's us relying a lot less on these platforms and then promoting the voice that we want to have by talking to you, by talking to women from different political sides of the aisle, by talking to women from different um, points of view, different walks of life, and then creating a, a cohesive narrative about who we all are. Who is our base as FDS? And then who are women in general? And what do we want? Or what are our, our pain points as far as what do we need from our politician? So that's my pitch. For female political strategy. I love it. That's a great strategy. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you, everyone. I mean, that's why I'm here, right? Like, talk to people that are different. And I know people have their ideas of what is this, you know, Caucasian sounding conservative chick doing here. Um, Having a discussion, having a nuanced discussion with people that the internet would want me to believe I have nothing in common with and are absolutely bonkers. And I'm pretty sure the same is reflected towards me. So I hope we're all here for similar, if not the same reasons and can grow as a community. All right. That's our show. That's our show. I don't know how we want to sign off these episodes. Bye, bitches. Think better, bitches. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Click. No. Do better, think better, fuck better. No, just kidding. That's FDS. Yeah, do better. (laughs) You can follow us on Twitter at Female Political, as well as our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Female Political Strategy. Thanks for listening, Team Female, and see you next week. (laughs) 